Hi. Um, I, will, I will say my, my usual words. If you have a cell phone and you haven't turned it off, uh, please uh, do so. That would be great. Thank you. And, and again, uh, there is a reception uh, in Case College Center in the spa uh, in the basement of that building immediately following uh, tonight's reading. Um, in this reading tonight, uh, I will introduce uh, Linda Spaulding first, and then after her reading, uh, Marilyn Robinson. We say about writers we admire that nothing human is alien to them, nothing off limits. They go where they wish to go and do not inhibit the free play of their own willful imaginations. Neither do they proceed as if there were no price to pay for trespassing into dark or forbidden places. They go on as if consequence were real as if they themselves believed in consequence as the guarantor of seriousness. In their writings, everything, even casual everythings, have weight. Awfulness is taken on not because it is chic, but because it is one way into our common experience. Mystery is cultivated not merely because it is one good way of sustaining readerly interest, but because it is an expression of the misgiving inspired by conflicts honestly engaged. Linda Spaulding has been imagining and recording the way we are and the way we live in a wide range of novels and nonfiction books over the course of an ample career. At times, she has seemed especially obsessed with places, with the spirit of particular places, Hawaii, Kansas, Borneo, the Great Lakes, and the effect of these places on their inhabitants. Elsewhere, she has see seemed the chronicler of marital discord or family tragedy, or she has turned her attention to small and large questions of guilt and innocence, betrayal and trust, custom and the corruption or perversion of custom. At times, she has worked comfortably within the rigorous conventions of the novel, but she has also been tempted, fruitfully tempted, to the very different precincts of memoir, science writing, the travel essay, at the time of her last visit to the Summer Writers Institute a few years ago, she had just completed a book called Who Named the Knife, subtitled A Book of Murder and Mystery, and covering a trial in which, for a time, Linda had served as a juror, only many years later to revisit this sordid affair and recast her sense of it and her own implication in what she witnessed. A various trajectory then for a writer of unpredictable appetites and a gift for invention and reinvention. Is there in so varied a body of work a thread that will seem to confer a kind of coherence upon such ranging preoccupations? I don't think so, or at least I haven't yet discovered the thread or the pattern. But I do have all the same an odd sense that this writer is as we sometimes say, all of a piece, that in all of her work there is a primary quality that belongs emphatically to her and to her way of taking things in and setting them before us. Call it, at least in a preliminary way, a quality of scruple, lightly worn, habitual, disciplined. You see it everywhere in Linda's work unmistakably. In Who Named the Knife? You see it in the way that she finds ways to associate herself with the apparent murderer of the tale, and yet, almost in the same motion, recoils from the association, or at least tempers the instinct to identify with her subject. You see this even in a simple sentence, quote, Marianne's father was born a Baptist like mine, Linda writes. But when Marianne talked about him, I felt jealous, unquote. Identification and, if not recoil, then at least distancing the felt 
acknowledged unwanted jealousy. I want to understand by getting close, finding commonalities, Linda would seem to say, but I won't be seduced by my own will to intimacy. My relation to the person I hope to evoke is more complicated and unstable than my own will to make this easy for myself. No self-congratulation in this, no explicit declaration of scruple, merely the steady display of writerly consciousness, allowing what is there to command her attention and yet not ever completely to have its way with her. You note this and admire this as you make your way through Linda's work and admire even the way she will say, even as she's doing her best to make compelling sense out of harsh or forbidding material. This is a quote. There is very little to be said about such events, unquote. And yet this writer finds ways to say and to suggest and to be always large-hearted and clear-eyed, merciless and generous. Linda Spaulding. Robert's introductions are, are sort of like a shot of, I don't know, B12 or something. They just amaze, you know, you just feel so great afterwards. If only you could believe it all. I'd like to thank uh, Robert and Peggy and Bill and Dana and all of you guys. You're just, this institute is wonderful uh, for those of us who get to come and visit and read to you because you're the best audience I've certainly ever encountered. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to read you... Uh, a uh, couple of little sections from new novel. The novel's called The Purchase, and it's called that because uh, it's about a Quaker uh, in 1798, 1799, who, uh, after his wife's death, takes his five children and new wife, new very young wife, in a wagon to southwestern Virginia. This is actually based on the life of my I think great 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 grandfather or someone who I started studying and um, he's a Quaker and uh, but he's been sort of exiled from his people because he's married this young Methodist girl in a kind of fit of desperation with all of these children and um, he's gone off to southwestern Virginia where he has no idea how to survive and as a result is um, reluctantly the buyer of a slave uh, this purchase uh, of this young boy's slave, uh, whose name is Simus, um, changes everything in his life and, and uh, sort of makes for what's, what's going to happen. Uh, so you'll hear about Daniel, who's this Quaker man. His daughter is Mary. Uh, the slave is Simus. And, um, and there's a, a neighbor on the next piece of land whose name is Jester Fox. Who is, who is actually the reason that, that he goes off to buy the slave because Jester Fox says, well, you're not going to make it here. Your kids are too little to help you and there's nobody to work for you. So, you know, if you want to survive, you're going to have to do this. And uh, Jester has his own slaves and he has a young house girl slave whose name is Bet who comes into the story. <clears throat> now, uh, what's happened so far is that Simus has... Uh, has been bought and he's come to work and he's broken his leg, which has caused a hell of a lot of problems. And uh, Bet, the young house girl from the fox farm, has come over to fix his, mend his leg. And uh, the two of them have secretly been having a relationship. Now, uh, da Daniel comes home from, uh, from church and finds that uh, Simus has disappeared. Unaccustomed to night rides. The horse thudded heavily through the dark, flaring her nostrils and heaving her chest. The full moon was in a fit of fast swimming across the sky, moving among the scuttling clouds as if it were buoyant. In its bright light, Daniel made out a hobbling shape on the road ahead, and pulling up next to it, saw that he had caught up with Simus. What is thee doing out with that shingle knife? he demanded. 
Simus had the knife in his left hand and a walking stick held like a cane in his right. The knife reflected moon and starlight on its angled blade. Old men, too feeble to swing an axe, were given this tool to split kindling. It was used to split barrel hoops and lath flats and willow poles, and none of these employments explained the boys walking out with it on the road at night. Simus said nothing. On your way to the Fox Place, is it, to cause more trouble? Do you want to endanger that girl further? Now, what's happened is that Jester Fox uh, has come to see Daniel that afternoon saying that um, his house girl is pregnant, and he blames Simus for this and is going to, he's, he's looking for her and he's going to find her and beat her and so forth. Daniel got down from the horse and stood facing the boy, clenching his teeth. Listen now. One look at the end, Jester Fox will make it worse for her. He wants an owner's revenge. Daniel reached out, holding the, his eyes on the boy's starched face. Give over that knife. Simus stepped back, reckoning his chances at anything but death now. Anything but death, including fight. He raised the knife. Daniel made himself louder, angrier, higher by an octave. He shouted, listen hard and believe I will act on the girl's behalf. He paused and drew breath and thought that Simus could not know what he meant, however hard he listened. He took the boy by an elbow so that the walking stick dangled from his hand. Hear me now. Hear me now. Jester Fox is raging. Go home. Go back. This is an order I give thee. Daniel was confused by a load of feelings. The boy pulled his arm away and struck his right hand hard with the lifted blade so suddenly that for a long moment it hung in the flesh, wavering. Pierced through the meat between thumb and forefinger, the hand was nailed to the walking stick. He been taking her, Simus sobbed, looking down at the knife. In sorrow, in defeat, he turned his face left and right. The walking stick fell with a hollow clank, and Daniel watched the boy's blood drip onto the road, watched it illumined by the moonlight as it made a dark pool at their feet. He did not for an instant believe what the boy had said about Jester Fox, but the smell of blood and the thought of such unworthy lust made him feel sick. He remembered then that Fox had accused him of the selfsame crime, but it was too much to think about or examine. You've given yourself a terrible wound, he muttered, swallowing the bile that had risen in his throat. But why? Why? Would a dog or even a wild animal do such a thing? There seemed to be nothing with which to staunch the flow of blood, for it did not occur to Daniel to remove his own shirt. The hand lowered now was gushing dangerously, and Simus did not make a sound, although he still held the bloody shingled knife. An injury to thyself pains the Lord, Daniel whimpered. Take Miss Mulberry home, he said. I will walk on to the Fox Place to see how things stand with the girl. The moon, full and stately, was still swimming through the clouds as Daniel trudged along the road. He kept his hands behind him as if they were chained and his head down, as if every stone on the road must be studied while his thoughts moved like the moon in and out of possibilities. He thought of the girl's face the only time he had seen it. She was not much older than his Mary. And what if Fox had been using her, as Simus proclaimed? Such things were said to happen on the plantations, where wealth had stolen the Holy Spirit from certain owners and turned their hearts to wretchedness. But out here in the woods of southwest Virginia, where they were all struggling to civilize the very ground upon which they walked, where they were required to live as Christians together or descend into chaos. Out here, it was unthinkable that a man on his own home place with a young and helpless servant and a nearby wife in his bed and children. The walk seemed to take forever. It was the good Lord protecting him, giving him time to meditate. What if Simus had told an untruth to besmirch the girl's owner and clear himself? On and on, this walking... What if Simus had visited Bet by cr crossing the creek? The road dipped and swayed. The moon rose higher and peered all the way down to the place, somewhere behind him, where there must still be a pool of shining blood, as if the earth had received a wound. No se de malas, he whispered. What if events were shaped by conditions rather than beliefs? Finally, the fox place could be viewed from the stony road as he scuffed along it. The small house stood stark and creamy against the night, lit by the sky as everything was, but reflecting that light like another white moon on earth. Daniel felt the strain in his thighs as he pushed them harder and faster uphill. Awake is what he wanted Jester Fox to be, and asleep all the rest of them. 
four that he knew of, Jester Fox and two almost grown sons and a wife. But there might be smaller children, so he must not frighten them. And where did that house girl sleep? He thought of the threat Jester Fox had made, a beating, and the girl was with child. Still, he must not plead over much for her rights, but instead make a case for her innocence. He would point out to Jester Fox that a girl of her tender years could no more know what she was about than one of their own daughters. No, no, he would listen. He would liken her to a young horse, as the comparison to a daughter might ignite things further. He would say that Simus had been injured, and that her heart had surely gone out to him, and that the two of them had been lonely for company of their own kind. Yes, he would remind Jester Fox that such children as they were knew nothing of consequence in their actions. As he came to the slope of land that held up the house, Daniel measured the distance from road to door and back to road again, as if he might have to find his way out quickly, remembering thickets and holes and making no false steps. He walked across the open ground without any sign of hesitation, although he felt now a great desire to stand and think out his argument. The reason the girl must not be punished, or the boy either, neither of them. A hound barked fitfully and howled with malice or longing. It made the hair rise up on the back of Daniel's neck. Inside the house, a lamp was put out, and the front door opened a crack. Who's out here? I... I come to inquire after the girl, Daniel replied unsteadily. And why should you bother when all her trouble will be the fault of Yorn? Come now, said Daniel. Let us help each other in this matter and seek the best outcome for everyone. Uh, he was croaking, pouring frog sounds hopelessly at the night. Oh, whore rightly punished, hissed Chester Fox. In the dew-covered yard, the moon lit up trees and slender stalks of wild grass, as if there must be something in all of it worth seeing. Fox stood a narrow opening that emitted no light. I would speak to her, said Daniel, coming fully up the porch steps now. But as he reached for the door, he felt a shove at his shoulder and stumbled backwards, then lay flat on the ground that it slammed into him. He tried to catch his breath. The door shut noisily. The sky was written with stars. The moon had taken itself to some corner above or lowered itself into a patch of branches, but the stars kept poking at the dark, making breathless, spotted light. He pushed himself up, brushed off his shirt, and found his way around to the back of the house. There behind the wash tubs was a shack, and he stood for a minute looking, then walked over to the thin walls of board and knocked. A moment passed. Hearing nothing, he pushed at the door, but there was only a heap of matting on the floor, nothing else. He thought of the place where Simus slept, realizing it bore a resemblance to this, and wondered if he and his neighbor were similar in a way he hadn't noticed. He smelled the close air of the shack and quickly dismissed this thought. Stepping outside and glancing toward the house, which, without the moon, still reflected the moon's light as if it bore witness, he moved into the bushes at the edge of the yard and felt his way back to the road, sore inside and out. He could not remember what it was he had planned. Wishing he had told Simus to bring the wagon and then remembering the injured hand, he thought what a bother the owning of someone could be. A hired man would be sent home during illness. A hired man would have his own lodgings and family, whereas Simus was a dangerous, willful child. Not an animal after all, Daniel thought now, for no animal, for an animal could be tamed. He came to the patch of blood on the road, still glistening. Then he heard a wolf howl in the distance and almost managed to laugh at himself. He was surrounded by the forces of nature. Even though the sons of Virginia had forged a great democratic union, the light of Christ had not been brought into these woods. He was walking on a path of blood. Jealousy and lust and pride and despair he had met in the last several hours and it was the woods and the fields and shadowy hills that provided the backdrop. In Daniel's innocence, he could not imagine that any wicked act could take place under a roof built by human hands. His prayers were wordless, but they addressed a heavenly parent who cared for the universe. He made this address less through thought, through thought than through the five senses. Or were there more than that? He stopped, gave himself over to inner and outer light. In the middle of the road, in the middle of the night, in his long walk home, he was magnified, taking in substance through every pore. Eyes closed, 
He took it in as a plant will absorb light. He smelled those plants which imbued the air with their musk. He smelled the fear and peace of animals in nests and holes. He tasted the coming of morning and on the end of his tongue and he heard the soft life of wind in the leaves that were rustling. He felt in the soles of his feet the resistance of ground. In his back and hips he felt the weight of his muscles and bones while his skin was an instrument being thrummed. Then at last he opened his eyes to the forest and sky. Nature must not be blamed. Only man betrayed his place in it. He took in the reappeared moon as a reminder of Christ. I'll go again tomorrow, he told himself, to make things right. Um, just, I'm going to jump a chapter to um, Daniel and his young wife go off to church, and uh, which Daniel doesn't like to do, but she kind of insists on it, and when they come back, they find that Mary, the daughter who's been left in charge of the younger children, has left the cabin. And he goes looking for her. And he finds Mary and Bet, the young slave girl from the Fox Place, and Simus, his own young slave boy, standing over Jester Fox's dead body. <clears throat> Mary, by the way, is um, uh, covered with blood and is holding a stone in her hand. Already that day, the horse and wagon had been out three times, although each trip seemed to have been years apart. The ride to prayer meeting, the long ride back home along the lengthening road and through the expanding forest and pouring rain, and now the ride to the Fox Place in harder rain. This time in the flat of the wagon, Jester Fox slid aimlessly back and forth. At the frame house, the two sons came out at a run while Daniel sat dripping and the rain kept falling. They rushed at the wagon as if they knew what it contained, and Julia Fox ran out of her house with an apron thrown up around her face. Oh, dear Lord, alive! She cried, oh, dear Jesus! She fell on the ground and beat at the sodden grass with her fists, muddying her clothes. She scratched her arms and yanked at her hair. The sons, Rafe and Ebb, screamed at a small group of workers. Get away, one said. The others shouted, get on over here. The workers were slaves. The boys were 16 or 17 by the looks of them. And Daniel thought of his own boys and bowed his head. I have brought back your father, he said, who fell on a stone of our creek where he had no business to be. He sat hunched on his wagon seat while the boys opened the back of the wagon, grabbing at the body. Daniel did not turn. He believed that Jester Fox looked disheveled, wet, and clean. His red hair, once matted with blood, was now rain plastered to his head, on the back of which was a deep cut and a shallow concavity. Julia Fox beat at the grass, which was wet and plastered like her husband's hair. Daniel began to climb down. He told her he was sorry her husband had slipped on the stones of his creek. He told her it had happened while he and Ruth were at church and said that there was no good reason he knew of for his neighbor to be wandering when the weather was inclement and the rocks slippery. Two children came tumbling out of the house, uttering girlish screams. Julia Fox began hurling whatever came to hand from her place on the grass. A hammer, a stick, a glove. There was the rain around them with its smell and feel and the flat sound of water striking softened ground. The sons had managed to get the body into the house where it must be soaking the floors and making a mess. This was the one day of the week the workers had to themselves and they normally used it tending their gardens mending their clothes, roasting a bit of hunted up meat, and getting together to pray and sing. Today had been different. First there was the rain. They'd sat inside the dark slave quarters pounding at something or whittling. There had come the departure of their master on horseback and the return of the horse without him. Now there was this wagon and the sense of catastrophe it carried. Today would be crooked and it would go on forever. Weren't they involved with this? What with the house girl run off and the master out looking and raging and what with the fact that if one slave is doing wrong, they all sure were blamed. Daniel climbed back onto the wet seat. As he turned the wagon around, clucking at his mare, he glanced at the frame house and created in himself a new sense of shame. He had thought Jester Fox fortunate to have such a house and even now as he looked at it, the front wall with its straight boards and windows of glass, he coveted what his neighbor had made. 
Often he had wondered whether pride or envy was the worst of his sins. There'll be justice to come, Julia Fox yelled, slamming the door as she went into her shining house, and I'll see to it. It came as a surprise to Daniel, nevertheless, when her sons turned up later that afternoon, surrounded by short bursts of gunfire that caused Daniel to step out onto his porch. The gun was a Lancaster rifle, and it was carried by yet another boy, but they all wore scarves on their faces, and Daniel did not recognize him. He knew Rafe and Ebb by their wild red hair, and he held up his hand for quiet. They had come on horses, fired by anger and justified grief, and he was aware of their youth, and also aware of their gun. Where's that killer, mister? Bring him out here for his rightful comeuppance. The speaker shot his rifle in the air, and Daniel's hand jerked back. Mary looked at the rifle before she looked at the boy who held it braced on his thigh. She'd seen many rifles and muskets in the course of her journey across Virginia, but this one had brass on its stock, and it was prettier. Killed a white man, your nigger. Where is he? shouted one of the brothers, and Mary shook her head and opened her mouth, but she could not put her mind to language. Her brother Benjamin had appeared. He said, He's just down by the creek. The boys... All of them rode off, crashing through trees and breaking low branches. Because this was the time designated for one of the pigs to be killed and hung on a hoist, Benjamin later confused these two events, which stood to reason, because by evening, Simus had been hung where nobody knew how to find him. Just a little last bit now. What am I doing for time? <clears throat> How long is the life of a locust tree, and how long is the life of a slave? You're having trouble hearing? Oh, okay. Here in the soil, just around and covering the roots of the tree, there are drops of blood, and a tree does not bleed. Above the blood on the ground, a boy is hanging, not by his neck, but by his hands. One of these hands has been torn through by a knife, but even so, it is easier to string him up that way and there's no one around to see him kick or to find him in time to cut him down. The sky is hovering over the thorny branches as if it would drop around the boy and become his shroud. The sun blinks shut for a minute, but no one notices this tiny night. Simus feels his arms pulled up hard like things unplanted. He thinks that if they stretch an inch or two more, his feet will touch the ground and he will somehow root himself again. He thinks about this new meaning of being free, only to touch the ground. He thinks it might be enough, but it will never be guaranteed. Simus feels the skin of his back and sides pulled tighter in an effort to take up the sag of his weight. He feels his bare feet jerk down and then up as if something has struck at his knees. He feels his whole body jump and spin, and he knows that someone is sitting above him up in this tree. Set me down now, please. Just set me down. We're going to teach you not to bash a white man's head. You're going to learn your rightful place. You plead guilty to it or not. The best and most humane way of killing a pig is to strike it down with the pointed end of a pole axe on the forehead, which has the effect of killing the animal at once. All that is left to do then is open the aorta and the great arteries and lay the neck over a trough. The carcass is then to be scalded, either on a board or by immersion in a tub of very hot water and all but the hair and dirt must be rapidly scraped off till the skin is made perfectly white. A pig, after being killed, is hoisted up high enough to be gutted and dressed, but a slave is hung first, still alive. A slave is hung by the neck or hands or feet, and sometimes he is gutted, and always he is left to rot. A slave is owned not by himself, but by someone else. Like the pig, he has no right to decide his own circumstance. His past is unrecorded, and his future is anybody's guess. This is therefore not a murder, because it is done to someone who cannot be deprived of what he does not own. But Daniel sets out on horseback, looking for help that he does not find. A white neighbor has been killed. Justice will take its course. Indeed, the boy will hang until his arms are pulled out of their sockets, and still his feet will never quite know the ground as root to soil. He will hang until animals come to feed on him, He will not be found for six long days and nights. And looking 
of looking, and by then all of Bet's herbs and unguents and potions will be useless, except those concerned with the laying out of what corpse is left. But while he dissolves, he will also retrace. He knows the ground he walked as a child, in every molecule of his two feet, and while they dangle, they keep hold of their sensitivities and send messages up his legs to his brain. While they dangle, they roam the slave encampment by the Tennessee border with its ruts and ridges so heartfelt. They touch the prickly stubble behind old Auntie's cabin, where the ground grows something that opens and shuts, something that prickles and burns, and where the cook pot swings over its arid blue precious smoke. He stumbles on acorns and crawls into leaves that are almost clean, what was smelling so dry and sharp. He hears old Auntie shout, and he goes on down to the river bank, which is slick from the wash tubs and white bottom feet. He lies on his chest and hears his heart pound soft against that ridge, where tufts of waxy green erupted in the summer, and the water's taste was thick like meat. He holds his face up over that taste and puts his tongue down to it, thinking of the wild animal. He had once seen doing this. For a while, long or short, depending, he spins and then hangs solitary, tongue and feet tasting. First watching the land and trees revolve, and finally seeing only a slice of it out of a slice of eye. The main image recurring has been the trunk of the locust tree, which is thicker than one man, or even two men, and possibly thicker than three. Each time he sees it in his revolution, it seems thinner. Two boys, then none, and the gorse bushes all along the edge of the field, and the fallen down other trees covered by errant, roaming weeds. Spinning, he's frightened to the point of terror at not knowing what will be next. But hanging, he becomes philosophical. He has been sacrificed to save Mary. He dangles and thinks more and more of the tree, the span of its trunk contrasting with the more meager branches overhead. Those branches are meager, like his arms, and the trunk is strong. But the life of the tree is shallow in the skin, as the life of a black boy is also. The tree will not read or write, and neither will the boy. The tree will feel its past and its roots, which are stuck hard in the ground. But the present is there too, in the dangling feet of the boy, like ants in the blood. When he runs out of water, the boy's insides will shrivel, and his brain will shrink. But the ants will keep marching all the way down to the gloss of the wet river bank. The boy will not think clearly then, so he must think now of all the times he has been through and of what he can still know. There was the long ride he endured inside his ma's tight belly, and once before she died, a moment when she called out, "Son," and he felt swelled up on that word, "Son." He thinks now of that moment and remembers playing with his brother in the stiff corn stalks down by the well. How they built something of the stalks without cutting them. How they bent and wove those stalks like strong fellows and rested underneath. And he remembers next a baby being in Bet's belly and her touching his bare skin. And maybe the baby is the same as he was inside the dark of his mother. And maybe it is the thing he calls the Dickens, for we are made in his image. And yet he longs to understand the purpose of things. Soon I will know, he thinks, and his next thought, while staring unblinking, is for Mary, who instructed him and befriended him, and was pleasant in his company, even bearing her clean feet and learning from him, and that had been the best part of his life. Thank you. So many things to say about Marilyn Robinson and her work, but one in particular that seems to me especially compelling. Consider what is by now well known to everyone, certainly to everyone who has been around these Saratoga precincts for the last 25 years or so, that in the decades after the publication of Marilyn's novel Housekeeping. She was by no means simply waiting for the muse to strike. 
She was, in fact, working at essays, notable for their polemical fervor, works she herself described as contrarian in method and spirit. Works, moreover, proceeding from the conviction, quote, that the prevailing view of things can be assumed to be wrong. What other writer, we may well ask ourselves, would find Freud's ideas remarkably meager, charmless, and ugly? Who else but Marilyn would declare, I miss civilization and I want it back? Who else would so ruefully recall a time, quote, when people had sensibilities and note the loss of any capacity among us for the reverence that is owed to human beings as such? Those of us who absorb these polemics and interrogations over many years were somewhat astonished when we began to make our way through Marilyn's 2004 Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Gilead. For it is a kindly novel, not cloyingly sweet or optimistic, but benevolent, willing to engage with opposition, but not to revel in the battle. Its accent is that of the Reverend Ames, who speaks in the first person throughout and who says, I have had a certain experience with skepticism and the conversation it generates, and there is an inevitable futility in it, unquote. When it comes to ultimate things, to things that really matter, says Marilyn's mild-mannered reverend, there is always an inadequacy in argument. And so it is lovely, we feel, that a writer who is so adept at argument, at thrust and counter-thrust, should have chosen as the voice of her great novel one that rises and falls without any inclination to disputation. It is a voice of humble but not unctuous piety, now and then troubled, occasionally amused, more disposed to moderation than to quarrelsomeness, and belongs to a character, however far from us he may be or he may seem, in the plainness of his goodness and his nearly perfect humility, entirely believable and deserving of our readerly solicitude. Extraordinary this feat of Maryland's, a feat among many others, to be sure, but especially remarkable in the sense that as readers we associate much that the Reverend says with the sentiments of his novelist creator, and yet cannot hear in his voice and bearing the temperament we have come to expect and to treasure in the essays and the lectures of our Ms. Robinson. Of course, much more might be said about the related yet distinctive virtues of Marilyn's novel, Home, a darker work, though not one permitted to settle into an easy pessimism. As with all of this writer's work, we note the sustained tension between the troubled conscience and the instinct for moderate joy, between intellectual mischief and generosity, between plainness and the feeling for beauty. And we know, too, that as the novelist Charles Baxter, Baxter has written, there is not a frivolous or casual sentence in Marilyn's work, and that hers are really life-changing books. And so I end there, and I ask you, please, to welcome back our dear Marilyn Robinson. Good evening. Thank you, Robert. Generous as always, although I don't consider myself a polemical writer. I'm so far out in left field, there's nobody for me to be polemical toward. But in, <laughs> in any case, um, 
I'm going to read tonight from uh, my two mo most recent novels, um, Gilead and Home. I have actually started a, another novel, and it's a sort of uh, revered tradition in this, uh, in this setting to read from new work, and I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you all want my novel to live, so I know you don't want me to expose it prematurely. In any case, um, I wrote Gilead in the first place and then home also because uh, I, did, I moved to the Middle West where I had never lived or expected to live. I moved to Iowa and I wanted to know what the history of the place was. And I did a great deal of reading in uh, 19th century narratives about the settlement of, of the place uh, using original material uh, as, as much, to the extent that I could. I mean, material that was contemporary with events and, and uh, written by people who remembered these crucial events of the settlement of uh, the Middle West by abolitionists. Um, the, this is a lost history of American culture, which I think is one that we really ought to be conscious of recovering. And um, it happened in the in the uh, late 20s and the early 30s of the 19th century that people who wanted to basically reconstruct American life on truly egalitarian principles moved into the Middle West and created intentional settlements um, that were like utopian communities in many respects. Uh, they typically uh, included the, the founding of a college. And so you have this whole archipelago of small, old colleges in the Middle West, including, you know, Oberlin and Knox and uh, Carlton. And there's a very long and distinguished list of colleges that were founded by these people. Um, they were stops on the uh, Underground Railroad. They all had printing presses that published abolitionist literature and uh, sent it through the country. Um, sometimes overwhelming the postal system. Uh, they were, uh, they all operated on what was called the manual labor system, which meant that the students and the faculty did all the work that was uh, in necessary to keep these sort of academic villages running. So that the president of the university slaughtered the hogs, you know, whatever. Um, they were integrated by race and by gender from the time of their founding. Um, in the case of Oberlin, in, from 1837, they were racially and gender integrated. Um, Knox College, the same, and so on. So there is a whole history of a sort of radical egalitarianism that was established in the Middle West to make the, that culture, that region, resistant to the economics of slavery. There was nothing to guarantee that the agriculture of the Middle West would not be slave labor in the same way that the agriculture of the South was, you know? And so these things were determined, famously, I hope, by votes on the, as, on the constitution of these states as they were uh, accepted into the Union. And so people from upstate New York, this region very, very much, and from New England uh, more generally, especially Yale University, went into the Middle West uh, to, a, to try to establish a counterculture, you know, uh, which they certainly, uh, in a very large degree, succeeded in doing in the period before the Civil War. Um, you'll notice that the great leaders of the Civil War period, like Sherman and Lincoln, were Middle Westerners. The uh, uh, Supreme Court of the Territory of Iowa uh, outlawed racial discrimination in their schools before it was before Iowa was a state. If you you know if you read the news at all, you know that we were the first state to uh, establish uh, equality in marriage, establish same sex marriage. Um, New York is coming along behind as it did in many other ways, but uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, one of the, the the things I think that's very destructive in this country is that we have profound and uninformed resentments toward other parts of the country, and we don't have a civilized conversation because I, I was just at this magnificent thing in Worcester, the uh, American Antiquarian Society, which is a wonderful, wonderful resource. But one of the things that they talked about was that 
these great abolitionists who were active in New York and, and New England, they, they went to Ohio. Why in the world should they have gone to Ohio? You know, it's like, for, like they'd fallen into the embrace of the most retrograde society that could be imagined. The abolitionists went to the Middle West in order to do exactly what I have described, create the, a culture that was uh, resistant to slavery. Um, they, they, Iowa uh, had more soldiers imprisoned in Andersonville, the southern concentration camp, than any other state. And, you know, um, Central College, which is one of the abolitionist schools, lost a larger percentage of its student body uh, in the Union Army than any other institution in the country, and so on. So uh, people think of the Middle West as being retrograde, being, you know, entrenched in negative senses of the word, when in fact many of its most important uh, institutions have been very, very egalitarian from the beginning. The University of Iowa, where I teach, was the first public university to accept women and men on the same basis, and so on. So there is a profound tradition there to be built on in terms of doing the things that many of us would like to see done, you know, um, the establishment of greater access to education, greater equality across all the divisions that have tormented us historically, and so on. So anyway, so there, one side of the story is that, that these really beautiful and admirable things happened all through the Middle West, in Lawrence, Kansas, in, you know, in, in Detroit, Michigan. On the other hand, it's forgotten. It's more than forgotten. It's as if nails are driven into the memory of it. You know, it's, it's counter-forgotten. Um, so, you know, and, and even by people who, whom one would expect to be learned in the phenomenon of 19th century social development. They, in fact, reinforce it typically. <clears throat> she said without any flirting with polemic at all. <laughs> anyway, I will read, I hope, pretty briefly from the endings of my two novels, both of which are sort of meditations on this town, Gilead, which is a, f a fictional town, but it's, it's uh, based on Tabor, Iowa, uh, which really was a, uh, a town founded by a man named John Todd, who was uh, an ordained congregational minister from Oberlin College who brought people from Oberlin College to help him create this settlement, to create a little university which in the typical pattern was racially and, and gender integrated and which sent women as educators to places like Korea and Turkey and so on in, in, in the 19th century and in many cases established the first uh, women's education in, in many other parts of the world. So these were very potent and very influential uh, communities that uh, are now forgotten. In any way, one of the things that's striking about it is that it's also forgotten there. When I went to Iowa, I would say, what's the history of this place? And they would say, it doesn't have one. You know, I mean, they've just ingested the cliche utterly. Well, I'm working on it. But <laughs> in any case, uh, so, so Gilead, there's no actual Gilead in Iowa. I think one was started and failed or something. But, but there are Gileads in most places in the country. And Gilead, of course, is a, the land of healing. The balm of Gilead is a famous phrase, the famous spiritual uh, theme of spiritual. But in any case, this is about an abolition. These, these books are about an abolitionist community in the Middle West that forgets why it's there. Um, in the novel, uh, things happen, but one of the things that happens is that uh, this sort of black sheep son, Jack Bowden, <laughs> leaves Gilead, and while he's living in sort of self exile in St. Louis, he meets and uh, falls very much in love with a black woman uh, the, who is the daughter of a minister, just as he's the, daughter, the son of a minister. Um, the, one of the things that uh, was always characteristic of Iowa is that there were never laws against miscegenation. There was a time in American history when there were basically two states where interracial marriage was not against the law. One was Iowa and the other was Maine. So 
he when he comes back in theory if the town remembered what it was and why it existed he could marry this woman who is in fact his wife he could normalize their existence he could you know he could live in gilead um but the town has forgotten you know and and uh and has has drifted toward the kind of regrettable consensus that developed in the country in the period after reconstruction so now i will read briefly after having talked at length <laughs> this is of course gilead is is told from the point of view of reverend ames the descendant of abolitionists um and he's just learned that that Jack Bowden actually has a wife and a child. I woke up this morning thinking this town might as well be standing on the absolute floor of hell for all the truth there is in it. Can you hear me? <laughs> Where did the no come from? <laughs> okay, okay. I woke up this morning thinking this town might as well be standing on the absolute floor of hell for all the truth there is in it, and the fault is mine as much as anyone's. I was thinking about the things that had happened here just in my lifetime, about the, um, the droughts and the influenza and the depression and three terrible wars. It seems to me now we never looked up from the trouble we had just uh, getting the trouble we had just getting by to put the obvious question that is to ask what it was the Lord was trying to make us understand. The word preacher comes from an old French word predicateur, which means prophet. And what is the purpose of a prophet except to find meaning in trouble? Well, we didn't ask the question, so the question was just taken away from us. We became like the people without the law, people who didn't know their right hand from their left, just stranded here. A stranger might ask us why there is a town here at all. Our own children might ask. And who could answer them? It was just a dogged little outpost in the sand hills within striking distance of Kansas. That's really all it was meant to be. It was a place John Brown and Jim Lane could fall back on when they needed to heal and rest. There must have been a hundred little towns like it, set up in the heat of an old urgency that is all forgotten now. And their littleness and their shabbiness, which was the measure of the courage and passion that went into the making of them, now just look awkward and provincial and ridiculous, even to the people who have lived here long enough to know better. It looks ridiculous to me. I truly suspect I never left because I was afraid I would not come back. Jack is leaving. Glory was so upset with him that she came to talk to me about it. She has sent out the alarm to the brothers and sisters that they must all desist from their humanitarian labors and come home. She believes old Bowden can't be long for this world. How could he possibly leave now, she says. That's a fair question, I suppose. But I think I know the answer to it. The house will fill up with all those estimable people and their husbands and wives and their pretty children. How could he be there in the midst of it all with that sad and splendid treasure in his heart? I also have a wife and a child. I can tell you this, that if I'd married some rosy dame and she had given me ten children and they had given and they had each given me ten grandchildren, I'd leave them all on Christmas Eve on the coldest night of the world and walk a thousand miles just for the sight of your face, your mother's face. And if I never found you, my comfort would be in that hope, my lonely and singular hope, which could not exist in the whole of creation except in my heart and in the heart of the Lord. That is just a way of saying I could never thank God sufficiently for the splendor he has hidden from the world your mother accepted, of course, and revealed to me in your sweetly ordinary face. Those kind Bowden brothers and sisters would be ashamed of the wealth of their lives beside the seeming poverty of Jack's life, and he would, be, and he would utterly and bitterly prefer what he had lost to everything they had. That is not a tolerable state of mind to be in, as I am well aware. 
And old Boughton, if he could stand up out of his chair, out of his decrepitude and crankiness and sorrow and limitation, would abandon all those handsome children of his, mild and confident as they are, and follow after that one son whom he has never known, whom he has favored as one does a wound, and he would protect him as a father cannot, defend him with a strength he does not have, sustain him with a bounty beyond any resource he could ever dream of having. If, Bount if Boughton could be himself, he would utterly pardon every transgression, past, present, and to come, whether or not it was a trans transgression in fact or his to pardon. He would be that extravagant. That is a thing I would love to see. I think I'll put an end to all this writing. I've read it over more or less, and I've found some things of interest in it, mainly the way I have been drawn back into this world in the course of it. The expectation of death I began with reads like a kind of youthfulness, it seems to me now. The novelty of it interested me a good deal, clearly. This morning I saw Jack Bowton walking up toward the bus stop, looking too thin for his clothes, carrying a suitcase that seemed to weigh almost nothing, looking a good deal past his youth, looking like someone you wouldn't much want your daughter to marry, looking somehow elegant and brave. I called to him and he stopped and waited for me and I walked with him up to the bus stop. I brought along the essence of Christianity, which I had set on the table by the door hoping I might have a chance to give it to him. He turned it over in his hands, laughing a little at how beat up it is. He said, I remember this from forever. Maybe he was thinking it looked like the kind of thing he used to pocket in the old days. Th that thought crossed my mind and it made me feel as though the book did actually belong to him. I believe he was pleased with it. I dog-eared page 20. Only that which is apart from my own being is capable of being doubted by me. How then can I doubt of God who is my being? To doubt of God is to doubt of myself, and so on. I memorized that and a good bit more so I could talk to my brother Edward about it, but I didn't want to ruin the good time we'd had that one day playing catch, and the occasion really never rose again. There were two further points I felt I should have made in our earlier conversations, one of them being that doctrine is not belief. It is only one way of talking about belief. And the other being that the Greek word sozo, which is usually translated saved, can also mean healed, restored, that sort of thing. So the conventional translation narrows the meaning of the word in a way that can create false expectations. I thought he should be aware that grace is not so poor a thing that it cannot present itself in any number of ways. Well, I was also making conversation. I knew he must have heard more or less the same things from his father any number of times. My first thought was that nobody ought to be as lonely as he looked to me walking along by himself. And I believe he was glad of the company. He nodded from time to time and his expression was very polite. As we walked, he glanced around at the things you never really look at when you live in a town. The fretting on a, on a gable, the path worn across an empty lot, a hammock slung between a cottonwood and a clothesline pole. We passed the church. He said, I'll never see this place again. And there was a kind of sad wonder in his voice that I recognized. It gave me a turn. So I said, you take care of yourself. They could need you sometime. After a minute, he nodded, conceding the possibility. Then he stopped and looked at me and said, you know, I'm doing the worst possible thing again, leaving now. Glory will never forgive me. She says, this is it, this is your masterpiece. He was smiling, but there was actual fear in his eyes, a kind of amazement, and there might well have been. It was truly a dreadful thing he was doing, leaving his father to die without him. It was the kind of thing only his father would, for, would forgive him for. So I said, Glory talked to me about all that. 
I told her not to judge, that there might be more to the situation. Thank you. I understand why you have to leave, I really do. That was as true a thing as I have ever said. And I will tell you, remarkable as it seemed to me, at that moment I felt grateful for all my old bitterness of heart. He cleared his throat. Then you wouldn't mind saying goodbye to my father for me. I will do that. Certainly I will. I didn't know how to continue the conversation beyond that point, but I didn't want to leave him, and in any case I had to sit down on the bench beside him on account of my heart. So there we were. I said, if you would accept a few dollars of that money of mine, you'd be doing me a kindness. He laughed and said, I suppose I could see my way clear. So I gave him $40, and he kept 20 and gave 20 back. We sat there for a while. Then I said, the thing I would like, actually, is to bless you. He shrugged. What would that involve? <laughs> well, as I envisage it, it would involve my placing my hand on your brow and asking the protection of God for you. But if it would be embarrassing, there were a few people on the street no, no, he said, that doesn't matter. And he took his hat off and set it on his knee and closed his eyes and lowered his head, almost rested it against my hand. And I did bless him to the limit of my powers, whatever they are, repeating the benediction from numbers, of course. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Nothing could be more beautiful than that, or more expressive of my feelings, certainly, or more sufficient for that matter. Then when he didn't open his eyes or lift up his head, I said, Lord, bless John Ames Boughton, this beloved son and brother and husband and father. Then he sat back and looked at me as if he were waking out of a dream. Thank you, Reverend, he said. And his tone made me think that to him I might have seem, it might have seemed I had named everything I thought he no longer was, when that was absolutely the furthest thing from my meaning, the exact opposite of my meaning. Well, anyway, I told him it was an honor to bless him. And that was also absolutely true. In fact, I'd have gone through seminary and ordination and all the years intervening for that one moment. He just studied me in that way he has. Then the bus came. I said, we all love you, you know. And he laughed and said, you're all saints. He stopped in the door and lifted his hat, and then he was gone. God bless him. I made it as far as the church and, when I, and went inside and rested there for a long time. I believed I saw in young Boughton's face as we walked along a sense of irony at having invested hope in this sad old place and also the cost to him of relinquishing it. And I knew what hope it was. It was just that kind the place was meant to encourage that a harmless life could be lived here unmolested. There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. That is prophecy, a vision of the prophet Zechariah. He says it will be marvelous in the eyes of the people and so it might well be to people almost anywhere in this sad world to play catch of an evening, to smell the river, to hear the train pass. These little towns were once the bold ramparts meant to shelter just such peace. Your mother seems to want every supper to be my favorite supper. There is often meatloaf and always dessert. She puts candles on the table since dark is coming early now. I suspect she has brought them from the church and that's all right. Often she wears her blue dress. You have outgrown your red shirt. Old Boughton's family have gathered, except the one his heart yearns for. They pay their respects and invite us for dinner, but these days we three love to be at home. You come in reeking of evening air with your eyes bright and your cheeks and fingers pink and cold. 
too beautiful in the candlelight for my old eyes. The cold has silenced all the insects. The dark seems to make us speak softly like gentle conspirators. Your mother says the grace and butters your bread. I do wish Bowden could have seen how his boy received his benediction, how he bowed his head. If I told him, if he understood, he would have been jealous to have seen it, jealous to have been the one who bestowed the blessing. It is almost as if I felt his hand on my hand. Well, I can imagine him beyond the world looking back at me with an amazement of realization. This is why we have lived this life. There are a thousand, thousand reasons to live this life, every one of them sufficient. It has seemed to me sometimes as though the Lord breathes on this poor gray ember of creation and it turns to radiance for a moment or a year or the span of a life. And then it sinks back into itself again. And to look at it, no one would know it had anything to do with fire or light. That is what I said in the Pentecost sermon. I've reflected on that sermon, and there is some truth in it. But the Lord is more constant and far more extravagant than it seems to imply. Wherever you turn your eyes, the world can shine like transfiguration. You don't have to bring a thing to it except a little willingness to see. Only who could have the courage to see it? There are two occasions when the sacred beauty of creation becomes dazzlingly apparent, and they occur together. One is when we feel our mortal insufficiency to the world, and the other is when we feel the world's mortal insufficiency to us. Augustine says the Lord loves each of us as an only child, and that has to be true. He will wipe the tears from all faces. It takes nothing from the loveliness of the verse to say that is exactly what will be required. Theologians talk about a prevenient grace that precedes grace itself and allows us to accept it. I think there must also be a prevenient courage that allows us to be brave. That is, to acknowledge that there is more beauty than our eyes can bear, that precious things have been put into our hands and to do nothing to honor them is to do great harm. And therefore, this courage allows us, as the old men said, to make ourselves useful. It allows us to be generous, which is another way of saying exactly the same thing. But that is the pulpit speaking. What have I to leave you but the ruins of old courage and the lore of old gallantry and hope? Well, as I have said, it is all in ember now, and the good Lord will surely someday breathe it into flame again. I love the prairie. So often I have seen the dawn come and the light flood over the land. <laughs> this is moving to me, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a nice prairie. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love the prairie. So often I have seen the dawn come and the light flood over the land and everything turn radiant at once. That word good so profoundly affirmed in my soul that I am amazed I should be allowed to witness such a thing. There may have been a more wonderful first moment when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. But for all I know, to the contrary, they still do sing and shout and they certainly might well. Here on the prairie there is nothing to distract attention from the evening and the morning, nothing on the horizon to abbreviate or to delay. Mountains would seem an impertinence from that point of view. To me, it seems rather Christ-like to be as unadorned as this place is, as little regarded. I can't help imagining that you will leave sooner or later, and it's fine if you have done that or you mean to do it. This whole town does look like whatever hope becomes after it has, begins to weary a little, then weary a little more. But hope deferred is still hope. I love this town. I think sometimes of going into the ground here as a last wild gesture of love. I too will smolder away the time until the great and general incandescence. I'll pray that you grow up a brave man in a brave country. I will pray you find a way to be useful. I'll pray and then I'll sleep. <laughs> Maybe
you I've read enough, huh? Hmm? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> well, I was going to read a little bit from home, but I think I've taken up my time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's music to my ears. <laughs> um, what happens at the end, and here I'm ruining all any possible suspense, but at the, at the end of home, uh, which ha happens simultaneously with Gilead, but it's simply told from another perspective, from another household, Jack's household, in fact. He has come home. He's hoping that he can bring his ha family to Gilead. Everything goes badly. He leaves alone, the scene I just described. Um, and uh, at the end of home, his wife... Um, comes looking for him with his, her sister and his son. So um, this is the, the scene of uh, his sister Glory encountering the, the wife and the son. Um, they've already spoken a little bit. They know, they, they know who, each knows who the other is. And she's trying to give them a present of some kind to take away with them. She went upstairs to the room Jack had had as a boy and took the framed photograph of a river off its nail and brought it downstairs. Then she, uh, when she gave it to Della, she said, Jack always liked this. I don't know why, really, but he kept it in his room. Della nodded. Thank you. The boy came up the walk to see what it was his mother had been given. She gave it to him and he studied it. She said, it's a picture of the river. Glory bent to the child and offered her hand, and he took it. You're Robert, she said. Yes, ma'am. I'm Glory. I'm your father's sister. Yes, ma'am. And then a long look, as if he were remembering or preparing to remember. Jack had a beautiful child, a beautiful son, who would sometime turn Bouton, no doubt, and lose his prettiness to what they called distinction. <laughs> Are you a baseball player too, she asked. He smiled. Yes, ma'am, I play some ball. His mother said he thinks he's going to be a preacher, and she stroked his hair. The sister opened the door on the driver's side and stood out of the car to stare across the roof at them. Della said, we have to be leaving now. Yes, will Jack know how to reach you if he does call here? Della put the boy in the back seat, and then she took an envelope from the glove compartment and wrote on it some numbers and some names. Her sister had started the car. Della handed her the letter. It was a pleasure to meet you. I hope your father will be feeling better. If you have a chance to get this to Jack, I'd be grateful. Then she closed the door, and the car pulled away. Glory sat down on the porch steps. She thought... If Jack had been here, he'd have felt that terrible shock of joy, no, worse than joy, peace, that floods in like blood pushing into a limb that has been starved of, starved of it, like wild rescue, painful and wonderful and humbling, humiliating, as she remembered it, because she had been so helpless against it. But that was her fiancé. Della was Jack's wife, she said so herself, and it made all the difference. Della had looked at the world of his old life tenderly, all the particulars there to confirm themselves, proof of his truthfulness, which always did need proof. I used to live here. I wasn't always gone. I was usually closer to home than he thought I was, so Jack had said, and how could he have seemed so estranged to them? And how cruel it was that he loved the place anyway, his little boy touching that tree just to touch it, the tree that sounded like the ocean. Dear Lord in heaven, she could never change anything. How could she know what he had sanctified to that child's mind with his stories, sad stories that had made them laugh? I used to wish I lived here, he said, that I could just walk in the door like the rest of you did. And they would not walk in the door. They had to hurry to escape the dangers of nightfall. The boy was with them, and his father would not want them to take chances. She knew it would have answered a longing of Jack's if he could even imagine that their spirits had passed through that strange old house. Just the thought of it might bring him back and the place would seem changed to him and to her. 
as if all that saving and keeping their father had done was providence indeed, and new love would transform all that old love and make its relics wonderful. Della had met Jack on a rainy afternoon. He was just out of prison, and he was wearing the suit, almost new, he said. He had bought with the money that was supposed to have brought him home for his mother's funeral. The suit he sold because it made him look like a minister. And he had come by an, um, and he had come by an umbrella somehow. Just the terror of his release into the world, certain he had lost his family for good and all this time, would have made him wry and incandescent, and so would the inadvertent respectability of a dark suit and a working umbrella. And there before him was a lady in need of assistance. She had said, Thank you, Reverend. Such mild eyes, such a gentle voice. He had forgotten that, the pleasure of being spoken to kindly. Finally, he told her he was not a man of the cloth. So began a long instruction in whatever he, he could, pardon me, so began a long instruction in whatever he could trust her to forgive. She has forgiven so much, he said, you can have no idea. And how would she forgive this, that she felt she had to come into Gilead as if it were a foreign and a hostile country? Did anyone know otherwise? Worn, modest, countrified Gilead, Gilead of the sunflowers. She carried herself with the tense poise of a woman who felt she was being watched, wondered about. Jack could hardly bring himself to dream she would come here, and there was reason enough to doubt, though he could not stop himself from dreaming of it either. They had the boy with them. Jack would be frightened for the boy, so they had to be back in Missouri before it was dark. They had a place to stay in Missouri. She thought, maybe this Robert will come back some day. Young men are rarely cautious. What of Jack will there be in him? And I will be almost old. I will see him standing in the road by the oak tree, and I will know him by his tall man's slouch, the hands on the hips. I will invite him onto the porch, and he will reply with something civil and southern. Yes, ma'am, I might could or whatever it is they say. And he will be very kind to me. He is Jack's son, and Southerners are especially polite to older women. He will be curious about the place, though his curiosity will not override his good manners. He will talk to me a little while, too shy to tell me why he has come, and then he will thank me and leave, walking backward a few steps, thinking, yes, the barn is still there, yes, the lilacs, even the pot of petunias. This was my father's house, and I will think, he is young. He cannot know that my whole life has come down to this moment, that he has answered his father's prayers. The Lord is wonderful.